I want to start with a question. How much should it cost to get a job? That's the right answer. We'll get there eventually. So <laughs> you're all graduates. You're all going to be graduates at some point of a august higher institution, uh, of higher institution of higher learning, and you can imagine a situation where at some point you'll you'll be given or offered a, a job, a position, and you'll be happy to accept it. And chances are, no one will ask you for thousands of dollars up front, much less tens of thousands of dollars up front, so that you can secure this job. But of course, for millions of people around the world. The reality is otherwise. The reality is that they pay thousands of dollars to labor recruiters, sort of like global staffing agencies, though on a much more informal basis. They borrow that money at、uh, high rates of interest, and they pay the agencies in hopes that they can get a lifeline out of poverty in the form of a job, generally overseas. Of course, these aren't good jobs. These are jobs at the very low end of the global economy. They are jobs that are poorly paid. They are often dangerous. They are insecure, and they are temporary. And so, workers, migrants, people around the world are paying more than they can afford to get jobs. These jobs are not simply sort of really far away and in places that we don't touch. They're very close to us in some key ways.、Uh, if you buy, as I imagine you mostly do, cell phones or computers or Other consumer electronics. If you buy clothes from time to time, you have likely bought from brands whose factories employ workers who have paid to get those jobs. So it is connected to all of us. And ultimately, when this goes really wrong, it's a form of debt bondage. These workers are carrying debt with them. They are not making enough to pay back their loans, and they are trapped. They cannot leave their work. So I'm going to talk at the intersection of sort of corporate responsibility, supply chains. And modern-day slavery. My organization is a nonprofit. We are based in Massachusetts and operate globally. And we work with companies largely to help them understand what's going on in their supply chains and the factories from whom they are buying things. This started back in the 1990s, mostly with apparel companies at that point, so clothing companies that were aware of the fact as they trans. Ported as they transferred production offshore into countries like China or into Latin America, there was a lot going on in their factories that they didn't know about. They didn't know what the working conditions were, so they put in place what they call codes of conduct, which are essentially sets of standards, ethical standards that would become part of the contract that companies have with their suppliers. These ethical standards were such things as don't employ children, make sure there's no forced labor on site, pay people effectively and fairly. Provide safe working conditions. So a company would say to a factory in China, "Say, I need 10,000 shirts of a particular color. Please deliver it by this date. And by the way, don't exploit people along the way." They would then hire us to go in and find out whether that was actually happening. We would go to factories and do things that we call social assessments. We would go to the factories with our local teams and talk to workers and ask them what their experiences really were. And we would look at payroll records, and we would look at health and safety records, and we would walk around the facility to see what the health and safety actually looked like, and we would talk to factory management. The idea being that if we could gather this information, we could then report it back to the brand, to the apparel company in those days, who would then work with the factory and the government and the trade unions and the workers to improve conditions. It's all very nice and logical, as you can imagine. Back in those days, much as today, there was lots to report, lots of violations to report. And we, as an organization, as we did this around the world, began to notice a strange correlation: some very unexpectedly severe violations in an unexpected set of or subset of countries. So, in Malaysia and Taiwan and Saipan, Jordan, Mauritius, Madagascar. We found really serious labor violations that surprised us because Malaysia and Taiwan, after all, are relatively middle-income countries, and Saipan was a U.S. protectorate, so it's not the usual suspects for labor violations. The serious violations included really unsafe conditions: locked fire exit doors, for example, so workers couldn't get out; equipment that was hazardous to use; extremely long working hours, like hundreds of hours a week, literally a hundred hours a week for months at a time with no days off. Systemic abuse and harassment of women workers, in particular, violence and suppression of trade union rights. So, a serious set of violations in countries that were a little bit unexpected. As maybe you can foresee, the commonality in those countries 
is that the workforce is a foreign workforce. It's not Malaysians in Malaysia or Taiwanese doing the bulk of the work in the apparel factories of Taiwan. In Taiwan, it's Filipinos and Vietnamese and Thais and Indonesians. And in Malaysia, it was Nepalis and Burmese and Bangladeshis. And in Saipan, the U.S. protectorate, it was Chinese workers who had taken the journey overseas in hope of making enough money to send back home and transform their own lives from one of poverty to one of relative prosperity. But of course, things had gone wrong along the way. They were subject to this very classic bait and switch. The recruiters to whom they had paid thousands of dollars promised them a certain amount of income, had even the signed contract that said they would get a certain income, and when they landed, the switch happened. They were not being given that amount of money. They had no freedom, and they were suffering as a result. So fast forward to the last few years. We've been now working on this issue for about 15 years, and we did a more detailed investigation in the supply chains for the electronic sector in Malaysia. Why? Because Malaysia is very important in the global electronics industry. Electronics is very important to the Malaysian economy. The workforce, as I mentioned, is largely foreign, so we had indicators of risk. We interviewed 500 workers to do a sort of statistically valid sample from all sectors of the Malaysian ele electronics sector. And what we found surprised even us. One third of the workers that we interviewed were in a condition of forced labor. One third of the workers in electronics facilities in Malaysia were effectively slaves. I can share the story of a man that we met and interviewed as an illustration of what this problem actually was. So we met this guy who we call Raj in, a, in the reporting that we've done. Raj was a college-educated Nepali, very smart, spoke perfect English. He came from a middle-income family. The family had a rice mill that was their source of income. It collapsed, and so they had to find some other source of income. They invested a lot of money trying to resurrect the mill. They got deep in debt. They had no real sense of where their income was going to come from. Uh, it's a well-established sort of pipeline for Nepalis who might go overseas and in doing so provide income for their family. Raj, as the best educated member of the family, was chosen, and he and his brother went to go visit a recruiter in Kathmandu, a guy who said to them, give me $1,500 and I can get you a job in a cell phone plant in Malaysia. $300 down now, $1,200 later. Raj thought this was extremely expensive. He tried to negotiate with the recruiter. The recruiter basically said, take it or leave it. There's a long pipeline, long line of people behind you who would like to take this job, so do you want it or not? They gave him $300 down, Raj and his brother did, and then they had to go find the rest of the money. They ended up borrowing $1,200 at 36% annual interest. Raj and his brother co-signed the loan, and the loan, as you can imagine, needed some collateral. It was secured by their family land. They took the 1200 bucks. they gave it to the recruiter. The recruiter said, great. Three weeks later, Raj was on a plane to Malaysia. In shifting from Nepal to Malaysia, he was actually shifting employers. He was no longer working with the Kathmandu recruiter. He was now going to be working with a recruiter in Malaysia. So he was facing a different sort of institutional structure in which he was operating. But he got there, and upon landing, the new recruiter took his passport away. Raj is working six days a week, 12 hours a day, in, a, in the clean room of a Malaysian electronics facility, a sophisticated facility, not your typical sort of sweatshop. He's making $250 a month base wage, $300 a month if he gets overtime. He tries to take half of it, $150 a month, and put it to pay back his debt. And there are months when he can do that and also send money home. But there are months when he doesn't get enough overtime or his family needs an emergency infusion of cash and he can't pay back the loan. He has to choose. He himself told us he's living on about $90 a month, including money that he uses to call home. And he spends, honestly, about $20 a month to call home to keep in touch with his family. We met Raj, we interviewed him about 14 months into his three-year contract and he told us he'd had enough. He didn't want to be there anymore. But there was no way for him to escape. To get home, he'd have to pay $400 to the recruiter to break his contract. He'd have to buy a plane ticket for $300. He would have to get his passport back. And if he did go home with this additional $700 of debt, how could he pay back the loan? There's no job waiting for him. He was trapped. 
His experience illustrates the problem, it's not unique. When we interviewed workers in Malaysia, fully 90% of them were in conditions where they had had their passport taken, 90%. 85% of them had paid excessive fees. This happens in Taiwan in the apparel sector. We have Filipinos who've borrowed $3,500 to get jobs in the apparel sector. It happens in the Middle East, where due to visa fraud perpetrated by labor recruiters, Indians, 20% of the Indians we interviewed had spent time in jail as a result of visa fraud. And in the United States, we have evidence of Guatemalans borrowing $6,000 to get jobs in the U.S. on farms and in plant nurseries that pay $150 a week. So the problem is widespread. Fifteen years in, we have some elements of a solution in place. We know where the problem is, we know why it happens, and frankly, we know what to do, with it, do about it. What needs to happen is that businesses need to decide they will not allow anybody to buy a job in their operations or in their supply chain. This is a complicated problem. You saw the two recruiters Raj dealt with, the two countries with visas that he had to, he had to get, the, the, the brand and the factories. It's a complicated problem. No single institution can solve it but we have a lot of allies who are joining this fight right now. And the most powerful one, probably, is the federal government of the United States. In 2012, President Obama signed an executive order that requires any business seeking to sell goods or services to the federal government to demonstrate that they have no debt-bonded slavery in their supply chain. The federal government is the single biggest buyer of goods and services in the world, so this is an incredibly powerful market signal. In the electronic sector, we're working with a number of companies to implement no-fees policies. Apple and HP have been among the leaders, and there are others as well. Apple has gone farther than anybody else. They've actually reimbursed fees to workers who had been charged them unethically to the tune of $20 million. So $20 million is now back in the hands of poor workers. <laughs> this isn't just a business problem, it's a moral problem. And it's one, as I think I've demonstrated, that affects all of us. Uh, I was privileged to be part of a meeting at the Vatican in December where the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury brought together religious leaders from all faiths and signed something called the Joint Declaration, Joint Religious Declaration Against Modern Day Slavery, which is aiming to focus particularly on getting businesses to agree to eliminate slavery in their supply chains. So we know what the problem is. We know where it happens. The idea of the solution is very simple. Workers shouldn't pay to get jobs. If we can ensure that workers don't pay to get jobs, companies benefit because they don't have slavery in their supply chains. If workers don't pay to get jobs, they themselves prosper. They can send money home to pay for their kids' education. They can build their families' businesses back up. They can pay for health care needs. They can eat better. I'd like to say as is typical in speeches like this, that there's a very easy solution for us all to sort of grab on and carry forward. That's not necessarily true in this case. If you, if you yourself own a business or run a business, there is a solution. Make sure that the partners you work with don't employ people who are in debt bondage. That's true whether you run a supply chain of a big company or you're hiring a landscaper or a cleaning crew. But if you're just a consumer, what can you do? It's a little more complicated. You have to take some initiative. You have to go to the brands that you like and encourage them to come out of the shadows and start to deal with this issue. This is a systemic issue. It's not one that's affiliated only with one brand or another, one company or another, or one country or another. It happens across the global economy. Companies need to be drawn out. And if you, as consumers, tell them that you're interested in hearing what they have to say about this particular problem, it will encourage them to be more open and more transparent. Ultimately, Raj expects us to do that. As far as we know, he's still toiling in this factory in Malaysia. He's still serving us in his indirect way. And the least we can do is everything that we can do to help set him free. Thank you.